Hello, everybody. Uh, my name's Ryan. I'm back with another episode of Technique Tidbits, a little roundup of essentially what we talk about in a weekly seminar that we've been doing out here in the Seattle MTA, uh, where we get to share our experiences sort of adjusting to teaching online, and specifically teaching music, though maybe stuff in here will be helpful more broadly than that. Uh, if you like this, if you find it helpful, make sure to subscribe, make sure to like. Uh, it's nice for the self-esteem, and then it'll make sure that you find out when I put these up. Uh, in any case, moving on to what we actually discussed today, if I were going to try and tie it all together, I, I would probably hang that hat on entropy will get us all, in that all of our best efforts aside, there will still be things that go wrong, and it can happen in all sorts of places, and the best we can do, or what I feel like has helped me the most, is sort of tuning how I respond to those moments. Um, and some of that comes with just being ever more familiar with what you're using and how to navigate it, how to adjust it. And some of it just comes with hope and dedication and perseverance. Um, to give a couple examples of how it was come up, coming up for us in the preceding week or so, um, one person was having a problem where, so she has the paid version of Zoom, she has a personal meeting ID, she's got it all customized and all that. So she sends it out to all of her students. Lo and behold, one of them joins early. She gets an email. Students arrived, waiting in your waiting room. She goes to her personal meeting room, expecting a little ding ding to pop in and let her know that they're waiting. That didn't come. And so all of a sudden, it seems like she's got two, but there aren't two. Uh, we weren't exactly able to pin why that happened, though I would say it's good sort of evidence as to why they keep updating things, little things like that. Um, but we did have two sort of complementary solutions that we had settled on. Because I'd had it happen before, and then she's had it happen before. And uh, The way that we, we went for it, on the one hand, what she did was she went and she found the email she had sent out with the link that the student had clicked. And she clicked on that link, and that got them connected. Uh, and as I say, the kind of complementary side of that is what I've done in the past is I'll go in to whatever my personal meeting ID and there's a little green shield in the upper left hand corner, at least if you're on a PC. Um, I think it might be in the middle on a Mac, but here I'll show you, I'll point it out here. Um, it's just up here in that upper left corner. So if you click on that, it brings up all sorts of information like your meeting ID and the passcode. Uh, and importantly, it'll give you the opportunity to copy the link to the meeting that you're in. And so what I'll usually do is I'll copy that real quick, send them another email real quick, and then when they click, that tends to work. Uh, the theme of that, I would say, is, you know, if none of that works, turn it off, turn it on again, see if that happens, see if it works well for you. Um, another place where entropy will get us is sometimes gear will break, or it'll be insufficient. Uh, and so you can have that happen in a couple ways. For me, it's happened at least by trying to go for non-brand instead of brand name products for things that are pretty vital pieces of my signal flow. So for example, let me show you a little bit of a different angle here. So this, let's see if you can get the little pictures on there. This is the Apple camera adapter cord. So it's a little dongle that lets you plug a regular USB into here. This takes lightning, so that is to say you can plug a little iPhone charging cord or something like that into there. It'll carry power and information. And then it goes out to a lightning, uh, lightning endpoint, that is. And that means you can take basically things like an audio interface or, uh, you know, um, any, any other USB-based thing that's important or relevant for how you've set yourself up, and you can run it into an iPad or you can run it into an iPhone. Super handy. I don't use it as much anymore because I've switched over to a computer as my hub, but uh, I used it a lot when I got going, and I know a lot of people still use iPads. Um, I got a knockoff version first, which was probably made in a factory right nearby, but wherever it was made, it did not work. It had no software, there was no support for it, and even though it was half as much, I still ended up having to return it, buy the new thing from Apple, and then all of a sudden it worked much better. So there are little things like that where sometimes cutting the corner really isn't worth it. Um, there's also situations where you're sort of fighting consumer grade gear against pro grade gear. Uh, and so an example of where that comes up is even just today, I had a problem at the end of our meeting where my USB hub essentially lost its mind. And the way that it manifested in the course of the meeting was my audio interface started flickering on and off, which is terrifying when you're dealing with expensive electrical equipment. Uh, 
And so I had to rapidly unplug it, make sure that nothing power surgy was going on. And I ended up transitioning over to my iPad, which is right next to what I'm looking at you at. Uh, and so I was able to make it through or what have you, but I did have to sit there and puzzle out, well, now why did that happen? I managed to connect that other things that had been plugged in also stopped working, and so that must have been the culprit. And I'll say this, going back to this little view here, I like my USB hub. If you don't know what they are, they're essentially a way of adding ports onto a computer that may otherwise only have one or two. Um, so it's got a little power supply in this case. A powered USB hub is really necessary if you're dealing with an audio interface. Uh, it sends the information out there, and it takes in things here. And you can see how these are blue, and this guy's yellow. So what's going on there is this one, you can even see a little lightning bolt, you can probably guess, uh, is going to pass power to whatever I plug into it. So that's where an audio interface would plug into. Meanwhile, these are really just meant to be passing information. It doesn't mean that if you plug something in, it won't try and take power. It just means it's not really meant to. Uh, which brings me to kind of the lesson that I learned today, which is that I need to be a little more careful about what I plug in because I had a bunch of things plugged in like phones for cameras, like how you're seeing me right now, um, that were stealing power, for lack of a better way of putting it. And so that put my audio interface on the fritz and suddenly everything goes wrong. Um, I have a new one on the way uh, that comes highly recommended by Sweetwater. I'll let you know about it when it arrives, but suffice it to say, it's a problem I don't ever want to have again. And then sometimes, moving on to kind of a third way that entropy will sneak in, we have the situation where settings will go strange. Uh, and we've all experienced this with the various Zoom updates where one, one day it works just fine, and then the next day you update and suddenly you hear yourself, or they hear themselves, or everything goes to mush. Um, Again, very frustrating in the moment when it happens. Uh, as an example, some iterations of that that I ran into in this last week, I had a lot of echo issues. So in the first case, I was having my own lesson with my teacher. Uh, and in the course of it, at first, he couldn't hear me. So I went around and I adjusted a bunch of little settings. And finally, we got it working, except suddenly I heard what was almost like a choral effect, where I would make noise and just the most tiniest little milliseconds later, I would hear that same noise again over it. So it made it kind of a, the effect of being in a room with an echo. Uh, so it wasn't totally undoable, but it wasn't ideal either. Uh, and it turned out, and here I can show you kind of what it ended up being, it turned out that I had told my computer to listen to it in a way where it was going to send that back to me. Uh, and so the way I found that setting was I went over here and I visited in with sound settings. And when I got in here, I went to, let's see here, I think it was in device properties. I think it was in additional device properties. And if you go to this point, you end up at a thing like that. And so that little listen to this device box drove me nuts for probably four days. Uh, and the moment I found it and unclicked it, thanks to some lovely helpful forum on the internet, lo and behold, that echo was gone. Uh, and so that's something where just bad software settings got me, or rather the wrong settings, not bad, just incorrect settings. Another one was I've recently rearranged how I run my sound. So I'd been running things through a, a mixer slash USB audio interface, and I had changed into my just regular Scarlett audio interface. Here, I can show you over here real quick. So I'd been playing with this guy, and then I'd switched over to this guy, which is arguably for sound transmission perhaps stronger, um, a little less user-friendly because you do have to go into software and actually set everything, set the levels. And to do that, at least with this one, which is a Focusrite 4i4, I'll share a screen here and show you what I'm doing, you end up using a program called Focusrite Control. So now that I've got it open, you can kind of see I've got a little input settings tab. And that will show basically how it's treating the things I've plugged in. So my mic is analog one. You can see it going up and down. If I play some stuff here, you can see it popping up on analog two. Um, and you see the sort of information coming in there. Uh, for those of you that have something like this, just so you know, instrument is really going to be referring to um, a guitar or a bass or something that really needs a lot of amplification. If you have a keyboard plugged in and you set it to instrument, you're going to have really much too strong of a signal. So you want to be careful about that. Avoid blowing anything out. 
Uh, and then this air stuff basically gives, as I understand it, a little more room at the sort of upper registers for that kind of airy feeling and sound. Uh, and then pad is a way of sort of reducing the amount of sound that it's going to send out. So if things are too loud, you can pad them. Anyway, back to output routing. The problem I ran into having switched back to this was I had a new student who, when we had our first meeting, go figure, could hear themselves. That is to say, they would say a thing, and about a second later, they'd hear it back in their ears. And I couldn't figure out why, because I'd had this setup done before, and I didn't have that problem. Well, it turns out this little loopback thing down here is what's going on. Uh, so it's essentially akin to that listen-to-device thing that we just talked about. It's something that the computer is listening to, and it turns out sending out with the rest of my signal. So without this muted, they heard themselves. Once I muted it, we got rid of it. I was only able to figure that out using somebody else as a tester because if I was testing it myself, the way that I'd avoid feedback loops also avoided that problem. Um, so there's lots of little things where you might need a buddy if you're really testing this stuff. Um, conversely, you can see there's a little headphone icon up here it's saying this is basically the mix I want to listen to. It's very important that it's unmuted, that VOIP return, which is what we muted over here, if you remember. Um, we want to have that open here so we can actually hear the other people on the end of the line. Um, so that was something where it was just, you know, again, mind-boggling, drove me a little nuts, and eventually worked it out, but it, it took some optimism. Um, and then probably the weirdest thing, the last thing I'll say about setting stuff is uh, I've been playing with things like Jam Kazam or Rock Out Loud or exploring like duet capacities lately, and some of that's involved making sort of like gear profiles, particularly Jam Kazam does that. And so you end up having this sort of internal conversation, I guess, at least, uh, where you have to make the balance between, do I want things to be fast or do I want them to sound perfectly? And you have to strike the balance that works best for you. Uh, and so that might mean that you have your buffer size, which is sort of how much space your computer gives itself to process everything before it sends it out. If you take it very low, it puts a lot of pressure on your computer, but it makes it a lot easier for it to go fast. Conversely, if you make it very large, then you're going to get probably better quality, but you're going to have a significantly higher latency in, in between when you do something and when they hear it. Um, and that's, you know, in a nutshell, uh, you know, the places that entropy has been getting us the most in this last week, at least of our small sample size.